Hello, this is Dan Alford, and you're listening to the Roboticist Chronicles podcast. We're doing a series on bands, business secrets, where I talk to the people that have helped me along in my career. Our specialties is vertically integrated. What that means, we need large buildings to not only house our engineers, but also our manufacturing space. So I'm bringing Todd Buster on today. Todd is our builder. He and I have been working together for 15 years to build out the over 100,000 square feet of space that it takes for us to build robots. What I've experienced over the years is your builder is a critical partner in your business venture. This is a great episode. I think you're going to enjoy it. Hello, this is Dan Alford, and you're listening to the Roboticist Chronicles podcast. This is another in our series on Dan's business secrets when I bring in guests who have helped me in my business over the years. Today's guest is my builder. We have Todd Buster with Horizon Construction and Development. Todd, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, Dan, thanks for having me. Um, uh, I'm honored to be here just watching your business grow and been happy to be a part of it in a small fashion over the years, and it's probably getting close to 12 or 13 years now that we, longer than that i think it's more like 14 maybe, I, I think yeah. it was 08 when we uh, bought the building on stebbins and uh, yeah i think you're right somewhere around there and that was the first project that's of been of many so it's been a good partnership i think for both of us over the years oh yeah i've done a bunch of projects together so uh i, I guess that's the point of this this podcast today is i've worked with a lot of builders once but I've only one, worked with one builder more than once. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad I've been the, the last one, and hopefully I will be the last one, but uh, it's been good. All right, uh, you're the subject matter expert on you. Tell us about yourself. How'd you get into this business? What do you do for a living? Uh, so we've, I have a partner, Cooper Cogdell. We went to high school together. Um, we both went to college. He went to tech. I went to Texas. My plan was to go to law school and I was kind of burned out on school. So went out and got a job in the construction industry right out of college. I had done a bunch of work. What, what year was that? 2003 was when I started officially out of college. And then uh, so previous, my family's been in the construction business. Um, so I had lots of jobs through high school as well as college in the construction industry and and I enjoyed it. Um, so that was kind of my natural fallback, um, getting out of school and found a job and moved to Houston in 2003, I guess. And he and I were both working for different builders and just, you know, some late nights and hanging out and we thought we could do it on our own. So, 2006 we started with uh one spec house and you know it was strictly a residential business for a few years but i had some commercial experience from my last job before we started our company and then with having friends in the commercial real estate world that had work opportunities for us that started developing into its own business so we have a residential company that Cooper mainly runs that, you know, all the new construction. I do a few remodels here and there, but uh, Horizon Development and Construction, our commercial brand is pretty much all me. And that's, um, you know, big focus of my day to day. And we met through uh, Barrett Gibson, right? That was the. That's right. That's the agent that, uh, and we actually had him on a podcast not long ago because he, yeah. he's another one of my. Uh, no, one another one of my business secrets because you got to have a good realtor in this loop. But uh. right, and Barrett Gibson, he's with Colliers, and um, you know we kind of same age and knew a bunch of people, became friends, and just started referring each other business. You know back then, and you know kind of still do today. So those kind of relationships have really made our business thrive of just having good good started out as friends but also business partners in the commercial real estate world that once we built up built up their trust they believed in us and you know referred us to their clients knowing that we would take care of them and that's really curated and started most of our business you know it's just been 100 percent on referrals word of mouth is the best advertising that's right. And you and I have done a number of jobs together. Let's see. I guess the biggest was uh, was about 
20,000 feet of crane serve tilt wall with a hook height of 25 feet or so, something like that? Yeah, I think the the eave height of that building is close to 38 feet, and it's a um, dock high building. So getting the cranes and it's, you know, it, it was it was a fun project. It was very custom and you and your team tweaking the plans to get it just right. But uh, it, it went well and, you know, it still looks great. And I think you had to do the retention pond too. You know, if you're going to build in Houston, you have to have a, a uh, if you're building commercial, right, you have to have a That's pond right. to go with the building. Even residential now, I'll any lots that. over 15,000 feet. That has really evolved a lot but especially after Harvey. Um, and it seems like yearly it's the guidelines and codes are increasing on the amount that you have to store. So the pond you have today would probably have to be a lot larger if you, Interesting. if you built it today. Mm -hmm. So, and that was, took some work to figure that out, how to place it and to get the square footage that you needed and, and all that and it's become even more challenging in today's time i see then we've you've done minor projects for me too we've uh, rebuilt some uh lunch rooms and i, I think you <laughs> think you built a deck for me at my home yeah we've so we first remodeled uh haddington and then the stebbins tilt wall project and then oh, i think you completely built out the buildings on 529 i also. did but we also did a mezzanine here at your stebbins building with all those new offices right, right. um several remodels at the stebbins building i think several at the haddington building your two buildings on 529 we installed mezzanines and full office finish outs one for your tenant one for you guys mm -hmm. put all your infrastructure in for your electrical uh, everything that you needed for your operation machines in that building, fencing, concrete. Um, and we remained friends through the yeah, entire ordeal. Right. Uh, <laughs> so we've, I've had some other builders, and I, I guess the mistake we made with the other builders is we paid them ahead of time. It's, it's, it, either there's a bunch of crooks in your business, or you got to structure the deals right, or, or what advice do you have? You know, because I literally have gone through half a dozen builders and I don't talk to them and I don't use them anymore. Yeah, there's, there is a lot of bad stigma on contractors in general when you kind of just get out and hear people complain about instances that they've heard of or happen to themselves. Uh, my best advice on that is hopefully you know somebody that you know has done some projects similar um word of mouth and references yeah, right just reach out to who you know that is successful someone that you respect and you know get their opinions um just doing google searches is probably going to end up bad because people like us don't spend money on having our name at the top of a google search it just it's not successful for us and it really doesn't bring in the clientele that we want to work with because that goes both ways. Um, the owner needs the right fit and someone they trust, but being the contractor, we have to have a good feel as well that we're going to get paid and it's not going to be a bad experience. You know, our goal is maybe this is our first project, but we don't want it to be our last. Right. And, at the end of the day, we're, we're friends and, you know, we go to lunch together or go hunt together or whatever it's going to be. And you, I mean, you build a friendship and a, you know, lifelong relationship that like your power went out the other day, you called me, I had it up and going the next day. I mean, it's just things like that. You want to help each other out because I know the next time that you buy a building and it needs a million dollars worth of work, you're going to call me. I mean, it, we're just looking out for each other as friendship and business relationship. And, I've got dozens of people that I feel that way about, you know, just over the years. That's the fun part about being in business. And, you know, every now and then you'll have somebody call me as a reference. And, uh, and sure, don't hesitate to do that, by the way. That, I appreciate it. Yeah, always. <laughs> All right. So we've always been doing tilt wall. Let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of industrial buildings. I don't know about that class A space. I don't know if you do that. But, I, you know, my stuff, it's uh, offices and industrial. 
and we we used to work out of strictly out of metal buildings and but i can i must tell you that i think there's a couple of big advantages to till well a they're a lot safer in regards to thieves they can't peel back the the tin and get in and b they just look so much better what's what's the trend what are your thoughts when do you go steel when do you go tilt wall uh, i agree with what you just said um definitely a big plus on tilt wall is security i mean you're not going to get many people that are going to try to saw through a six to nine inch concrete wall to, you know, grab a piece of equipment, but you know, they're, they're not going to know how to do it. They're not going to have the equipment. It's too risky. You know, a metal building, a pair of 10 snips and you're in and you're in, um, they're going to hold up a lot longer. I mean, concrete there's, you know, who knows how long it's going to last. You don't paint it. You don't have to maintain it. Once you start painting it, then, all of a sudden, it's a maintenance issue. There's going to be some maintenance involved over time with shifting and your joints, you know, maybe having to get those resealed um, in paint, yes, depending on the weather of it, color. But there needs to be some sort of a seal on it regardless, and there's going to be some maintenance on that. But, you know, metal panels will rust. They're going to have the same maintenance. You're going to have to paint the metal panels. You know, you don't have to if you don't care what the building looks like, but most people take pride in their buildings and want them to look well. So I don't really think you're going to have that issue on metal or tilt panel. All right, so we're going to build two shell buildings, one steel and one tilt wall. Give me dollars per foot on a 20, 30,000 foot building. Um. I think you're probably looking at about a 15 to 20 percent more oh, on the tilt wall on a that's a that's a deal then. on a shell building. Mm-hmm. Um, I, there's a lot of aspects though. When you know, I get the question all the time: How much per square foot? Constantly from brokers or customers or but it's there's so much more that goes into oh, it. Oh, I understand. I was just putting you on the spot. Sure, but. How big is the track of land? How much paving are you going to have? Because all those equate to detention and storm, and it's, it's and permitting, depending on whether you're in the city or in the county. And yeah, I mean that's not going to really drive the cost much, but it'll drive time. Yeah. Um, but that that can be a really tough question, and it's there's so many variables. Well, I have no regrets. We're sticking with tilt wall from here on. I, I think you should. Mm-hmm. All right. So how do you how do you recommend somebody structure a deal? So they they show up like and I don't know if there's a difference between a uh, a rebuild and new construction, but how do you, how do you like to structure a deal? Is there down payment, progress payment? What's the best way for the 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 owner and the builder to work together? So typically our contracts are the standard AIA contracts that just about every um, general contractor is going to use. It's all the attorneys know how to edit them and make their comments. And, you know, it's just kind of the standard contract. We hang on. How many times have we worked on a handshake? Probably more times than, yeah, okay. but <laughs> <laughs> I don't advise that. <laughs> um, but you know, okay. In the, people, in, the, in the real world, you in the real, you, you, you know, have this standard contract, right? AA contract. We like to use fixed price contracts. Um, there's a lot of contractors out there that have used, or even it's even getting more difficult fixed price today. Just the volatility of the market with materials. Um, but let's just say pre-COVID. Fixed price is what we always kind of believed in. And the reasons are, you know what you're getting. It's on a cost plus contract. You know, if I told you the steel package was 200,000, but at the end of the day, it comes in at 250,000. Legally, you sign the contract and there's nothing you can do about it. And it all kind of goes back to our mindset of, we don't want this to be a one and only project. I want it to be fair for myself and fair for you. Um, And I, I just, you could get in your head, Oh, you see an additional truckload of steel show up that, you know, well, why is that? I'm having to pay for that. And just 
people can start questioning every time that there's an extra piece of material. But if we have a set number that you already know, hey, this is what I was told it's going to be, this is what it's going to be, you don't have to have those doubts or worry that something shady is going on. And we, I just feel like that has always been the best way to maintain a good client relationship. And at the end of the day, that we're all happy. And sure, a lot of times there's going to be change orders, but it's going to be for something that you added, not that was just an additional cost that I didn't pick up or it's going to be something that wasn't on the drawing. You want an additional crane or you want, you know, Four 10, square feet or <laughs> 10 extra 480 plugins for a welder, just, you know, things like that, that maybe you hadn't seen or anticipated before we signed the contract, but it's a choice of yours, not something that has to be done in order to finish the project. And, and, and just for our audience sake that you have never come to me with a change order. I bring them to you. Right. And that's how we want it to be. I mean, we don't, we don't want to create change orders ourselves at all. The, the only, you know, at times you could get into, say, some subgrade conditions in the soil that weren't anticipated even with the geotechnical report. And, you know, you don't know exactly what's under there sometimes until you start digging. And we have found old pools or that people just covered up but not compacted. So you have to go in there, remove all of that, and compact it properly. Well, it's kind of hard for us to just take that cost because it can be significant. And as long as you have someone that understands, you know, unforeseen, something that we, there's no way that we could have known about this. But that's kind of, especially on a new build type project, once you get the slab poured, you're out of that. So, oh, so most of the variables are on the foundation. That's right. <clears throat> you control your destiny once the slab's down. All right. Interesting. All right. So today is August uh, 2022. So, you know, just to timestamp this thing, we're coming out of COVID. We're coming out of uh, the whole work at home concept. Let's see. We're going into a recession. We're going into inflation. That's my take. I don't know about your take on things. But right. I, <clears throat> I agree. I'm seeing a lot of uh, four lease signs here in Houston, Texas. Now, I'm curious, is that, or is that because of recession? Are uh, people downsizing uh, businesses just to general economics? Or is that to, from work at home? Got a feel for this? You know, just we, we also service four or five office towers in town where we do all the office finish out. And I would say that that the leases and the vacancies are much more on that end and just you know meeting with commercial real estate brokers every week talking on the phone with these guys that's not the case in the industrial market ah um they finding space right now is very difficult either to buy or to lease it's those guys have had some of the best years of their careers in the last few years just with the inflation of the real estate all over the country but you know firsthand that you and i have seen here you know home values commercial real estate values how they've gone up there's just a ton of money out there in these big REIT groups that are buying up commercial real estate on cap rates and and everything else i think it once COVID hit these office towers and office buildings were just, there was nothing going on. I mean, they were vacant. Everyone was going home. Everyone was scared to death. And then I think once everyone started kind of settling in, but it took a while. Right. Years. They're, they're bringing people back to the offices. A lot already have, but I think there's still a lot of people that are not. But again, just listening to who I consider experts in the market that the productivity is not what it is being at home versus being at the office. And I think that that kind of honeymoon phase is wearing off and, and you're going to see a lot more people back in those office towers. Um, so that will probably go away. Well, that's encouraging. And so you're saying uh, manufacturing strong is just the offices, uh, office type businesses or just based off of my knowledge and 
the real estate market here in town and what's going on. Yes. You know, cause my backlog, uh, is, looks pretty good right now, you know, and that's all manufacturing, but, uh, the, the number of four lease signs is high. So that, that might explain it to me then. I, I hope you're right. Yeah. I mean, I can't predict the future, you know, obviously in Houston with a highly driven oil and gas market and industry with the prices of oil and gas where they are currently, there's a lot going on. Yeah, I like it. And, you know, there's a lot of need for space and service companies and, and everybody else. Um, so normally when oil and gas prices are high, Houston is doing well. Um, it trickles down to so many different people and almost everybody, if you really think about it, it's some form or fashion. Just, you know, gas stations and retail people, because you've got, everyone working at the Weatherfords and the service companies that are making more money that can go out to eat more or buy more clothes or buy new cars and boats. And, you know, just if you really stop and think about the impact it has and a lot of folks don't like, you know, the waitresses or waiters at restaurants or the, you know, just someone selling at a retail store, they don't like the high gas prices. But people they should love it. People like to really complain about it constantly but they're not thinking about the overall picture that the reason why they are making an extra $10,000 a year is because of that. And how much are they really spending a year more on fuel in their car? It's probably pretty minimal. Oh, I agree. You know, I've, I've seen numbers anywhere from seven to 10 jobs are, are created by every manufacturing job. So I'm proud to be part of that. And you know, I couldn't do it without your buildings. Yeah, I think that's true. So, uh, it's kind of an interesting deal. You know, you also uh, did some work at my home for me, right? Yes, sir. And uh, and my wife was all anxious about this, you know, because nothing's perfect. And I said, I said, you don't understand how, how, how Todd works. I said, he understands nothing perfect. And at the end of the job, you give him a list and you never complain. Is that true or is that just with us? <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, and, and that's something that I stress at the beginning of a project with a new client or somebody that we haven't worked with I said, look, there are going to be things that go wrong. There's going to be problems. It's just, it's impossible to avoid that in this business. There's, you know, material defects, there's, you know, labor defects. It's just, it's going to happen. Nobody's perfect. But what I can tell you is that we'll take care of it and it's going to be right at the end of the day before you sign off on it. And, you know, typically, whether you're moving into a new tilt wall building that we built or the remodel at your house, there's going to be a few things that you're going to see, or maybe we're waiting on a couple of parts, but you give us the list and within, you know, a couple of weeks, it's, it's going to get taken care of. And, you know, you can have two different clients. You get two entirely different lists. True. You know, it, people it's focus not on different yeah, things. It's not broke. It's just somebody's picky about paint and the next guy's picky about molding. God knows, you know, so. Right. But, uh, but after after our first building home building experience with you, my wife's much calmer now, and she knows that uh, it'll be fine. Yeah. Anytime I, my Kathy's calling my phone, I know there's kind of a minor or major emergency going on, and uh, we get over there and get it taken care of. Oh so. yeah, yeah. No, you're her problem solver, particularly when I'm out of town. So that, that's worked out real well. So, so uh, you're a builder, right? Are you doing any uh, projects on your own? You know, speculative stuff? You know, that's how we started our business. Really? It's, I think it's kind of really the only way to start. Be just unless you want to go that advertising route and just try to build a name. So you, you're, you were your own first client then? I was. Our first project ever in 2006 was a spec house on a street called Pagewood and Larchmont, which is a neighborhood close to the Galleria, you know, basically Richmond and Chimney Rock. And it's it's where I lived at the time. A lot of people or our friends, group of friends, rented houses in that neighborhood right after college with roommates. And then a few years after renting, purchased a house there. And it was, it was a fun place to live other than all the theft because it's too close to 59 and 610 and easy to get in and out of there. But other than having a few cars stolen and a few house getting broken into a few times, uh, you know, but so yeah, that's how it all started. And then, you know, 
lots of growing pains on that project. Just, you know, we were young and thought, Hey, we can do this. We're building houses for these other guys. We're, you know, we're going to make a fortune. Well, it wasn't quite that easy, but, um, it, you know, we had our name out there and people started noticing and asking questions. And then, you know, we're offered our first remodel job in that neighborhood. And then it just, that's how it all started. And just network has grown tremendously, you know, since day one. Um, we've done a lot of work for friends and they're referring folks. And, you know, a lot of people say, and I still hear this, that you don't mix business and friends. Well, I completely disagree. I'm with um, you. As long as you have the integrity and you know you're you're gonna do the right thing, and it, those are the people that you trust, the people that you know. Why would you not do business with your friends? That's why we'll allow you to do time and materials on some projects because yeah, I know if you'll be fair, it's probably needs, be cheaper than a fixed price. If you. it needs to be something done quick, or we don't have a lot of time, or the drawings aren't great, and that. You know, those are the kind of times when you when you do that. But again, I wouldn't do that for just anybody. And like I said before, it goes both ways. You know, you can have bad owners and bad tenants is just like you can have a bad builder. Trust goes both ways. That's right. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me, uh, so are you doing any commercial, speculative commercial stuff? Uh, currently, no, but we have. You have. Um, and kind of getting back to that. So starting out, we did, we've done four residential speculative houses and we did a six unit townhouse project and none of them were great. None of them. The, the first one, it had to happen to start our business. Yeah, so, Cause nobody else trusted you. Right. <laughs> there wasn't much profit in that. It kind of, sat on the market for a while and then the next house we did it actually sold before we finished it it was fine then we did a bigger house of course they you know get bigger natural and we kind of had this big house going in town in afton oaks at the same time that we had this six unit townhouse project and that was around 08 or so when the economy really took a fall so the, the finish on those was bad. When we started them, everything was great. And yeah. so we ended up, you know, that house deal wasn't good at all. We finally sold it. The townhouses we had to hold for a couple of years and lease them out. And then once the economy got better, we started selling them. And, you know, kind of ended out on those at the end of the day as a wash. And we did one other house that it was okay. It wasn't great. The people that made all the money on those projects were the banks and the realtors, but it was necessary. And also people that would come look at them and open houses. Mm -hmm. We got some great projects. You handed of, out a lot of business cards because of that. Exactly. So financially they weren't good, but they've evolved, help us evolve and picked up some really nice jobs. And, we kind of knew that after the debacle, the last one we did, we were running the numbers. We're like, look, we know this isn't going to be a huge gain for us or net profit at the end of the day, but it's going to be high visibility. It's on a street. Lots of people are going to see it. Mm -hmm. And we got some good work off of these other ones. So we feel like the same thing will happen here. And that's why we did it. And, that was probably in 2011, maybe. So okay. we haven't done anything residential spec in 10, 11, 12 years. Commercially, though, we have done some developments. We, um, we've partnered with some, some different people and you know purchased some raw tracts of land that we have um, built buildings on and sold and subdivided and just so you don't want to be a things. landlord, do you? No, yeah, I do want to be a commercial landlord. And, and what do you keep selling these things? Well, we keep some and we sell some. It just kind of, you know, we could have easily leased the building, but I'm not going to turn away a profit. And That's those right. are some things that I've learned, you know, yeah. bird in hand versus 
and there's plenty that I can look back on and say, man, if we'd have held on to that for another year or two, or, but the profit that was made on that allowed us to move forward with some right. other stuff. And we can all say that. I mean, hindsight, Never 20, 20, right. You, you can't. So our philosophy has always been on those type of projects that if we get an offer that we feel is good, fair at the time where we can make money, take it and move on to the next one because you never know what's going to happen in six months if you turn that down and yep. maybe you're sitting on it for who knows how long. I mean, it just, you can't lose if you take advantage of those opportunities. I see. All right. So you're alluding to various problems. Talk about how to, you know, dealing with the owner and a builder. How do you, what problems can you avoid? What problems should you be aware of? How do you make it so that at the end of the day, everybody remains friends? Are you kind of talking about after everything's signed up and we're under construction or? Well, the whole, the whole process, you know, this, this, this whole podcast is for other entrepreneurs, you know, that may want to start building a building. I mean, I think it all really falls back on kind of what we talked about before of just reach out to your network chances are pretty good that, you know, somebody, you know, is going to have had a good experience and really spending the time on the front end to pick the right contractor. Because once the contract is signed and it it's too late. Yeah. And even though you, you know, I've heard of instances as well, where every once in a while you can get a bad referral from a friend. So you, you, you really kind of need to do your homework on the front end. Yeah, is it a match? They right. might be a good builder, but you right. got to be a match on Maybe it's not the right personality, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's the most important thing. And then the details. Having as much detail as you possibly can on the budget scope of work that ties into the contract. So everyone is on the same page of exactly the standard and the materials that are going to be used, which again comes along with hiring a good architect right. and engineers that and you have architects at your disposal, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We them. have great people to work with. You've, yeah, you've worked with most of them. And so I would say, I think the front end work is the most important to having a success, successful project, having it all spelled out. So, okay. Make you're a not, good builder. Define right. the scope. Right. Just like, you know, you're going to say, well, I thought we were, you know, going to have aluminum handrails, but someone just installed, you know, just regular old steel handrails. But so all it said was handrail. It didn't say the material. Maybe you'd even talked about it, but just that's an example. Just something like that to where the materials, everyone's on the same page. That's what was priced. That no surprise. Your expectation is what's on paper. Because if it's on paper, you just go back and look. Hey, this is what it was. Nobody can argue that. Hmm. Yeah, and that's worked out well for us. You know, plan the building and then build a plan. And we want that as well. That's the last kind of scenario that, yeah. oh, I thought you wanted this, but you thought you were getting that. So mm -hmm. the upfront details, very important. All right, so I've bought a bunch of buildings. We built a few buildings. We finished a few buildings <clears throat> and to me that always boils down to availability you know if, uh, and timing so I guess right now if I were to hand you a piece of land and <clears throat> and I wanted a crane serve building with with offices in it when can I have this <laughs> in well, the city of Houston in the city of Houston with, with the permits so you're closing on the land tomorrow and yep. you're like all right here it is when can you deliver this? Yeah. Give me a guesstimate. Well, you're you're probably going to spend five or six months on the design. Right. So the architectural, then moving on to engineering, civil, structural, right. all your MEPs. You maybe could get it done a little faster than that. If Have we started the permitting process no, while this is going on? No. We're still waiting. Once all that's done, then you submit for permit, which... How's that taking now? What's that taking? On a ground-up job of that nature, I mean, you're probably going to have at least three rounds. Wow. Of comments. 
Or maybe two rounds, of, uh, an original submittal and probably two rounds of comments. This is months, right? That's correct. Each each round is going to be about 30 days, but there's going to be some lag time. So say it takes 30 days for your initial submittal. Then you have to get everything back out to everyone associated. They have to answer the comments, get everything. So back we're submitted. we're a year out, and you haven't you haven't dug a spade full of dirt yet. Probably. Okay, and then close to it. Yeah, but then I've seen how fast you guys work. Then it gets quicker, right? Right. Once we that that takes probably longer than building the building. Yeah. Um. So. Cranes are year and a half. Year and a half. Okay. So I guess that's the that's the message to the entrepreneur that may be listening to this. Uh, be prepared for the long term if you're going to build from the ground up. So that's another thing we've done. We bought shells before, and then you finished them out. So I guess that's the intermediate step uh, that still requires permitting and and design and such. So, uh, so I think. I, guess, I suppose it's the local business economy and and timing that determines whether you you buy an existing building buy you know buy a shell or build from the ground up. Yes, I mean it's hundred percent. The shell buildings that you've bought, I mean, we can get in there and you know those space plans and the drawings don't take too long. Quick. There's no civil engineering involved, which is a huge piece of the new construction and developments. You'll, you'll have a little bit of structural engineering if you're doing a mezzanine or something of that nature. Right. But if if you're not, just the, your regular light gauge studs, you know, you don't have to get structural engineering for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that process can be much quicker, and the comments are going to be way less. I see. Typically, that's going to be a submittal, probably one round of comments, and, and you get your permit if you have a good design team that you're working with and then getting in and knocking out, you know, an office 60 days or so. Okay. That's good. Depending rule on the size. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a way different timeline, but if you're planning on developing your own building with the raw piece of land, you need to give yourself plenty of time. If you're in a current lease or you're thinking about selling your current facility, it, it always takes longer than what people that have never done it, think and just a lot of these city folks they were at home there was no one at the office so you can imagine the timing that it took uh, people are back at the office i think there's still some that are not but it was not a good situation for us at all as builders the timing was just no you couldn't really predict it yeah well all right but there is no one answer to this you know because i've done it all three ways so but, uh, but you definitely need a builder at your disposal because even in the best case scenario, I don't believe we've ever taken over a building without knocking down a few walls. And that would rarely happen, right. I think, with just about anybody because you're going to have a different need than the previous occupant. If nothing else, utility requirements will change. That or, I mean, at the bare minimum, you're going to want to go in there and put in new flooring and paint the walls and, right. you know, mm -hmm. simple things like that, which... We do that as well. I mean, we'll, oh, I've seen you do it. Yeah. I mean, if you call me, we'll come change a light bulb, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I try to avoid that. All right. So we're kind of winding down. Any other comments, any words of wisdom for, uh, for the next entrepreneur you work with? You know, I think we've covered a lot of it of just, you know, protecting yourself up front when you're choosing a contractor and, you know, hopefully maybe you only have to do it once if you meet the right one and, and then, you're good to go, but, um, it can be a competitive market and people have different mindsets on it. You know, you're going to have some owners that it's whatever the cheapest way to do it is. That's what they're going to do no matter what. And it's probably not going to turn out that way at the end of the day. You know, there's been plenty of jobs that we've lost due to cost, but then I've found out at the end of the day, well, they didn't have this or that, and they didn't know that, so it actually ended up costing more than what our fixed price contract, and maybe they signed a cost plus contract, so the contractor didn't care. All right, he'll get his money. He's going to get more because if it's cost plus, the more you spend, the more he's going to get paid. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another thing you need to keep in mind. There's really no incentive to save money. It's if, cost plus. That's right. Um, 
Now, you're the rare exception that I'll trust with a time and materials contract. Right. Well, I've proven to you, though, over the years. And again, I don't I don't like even if most people wanted to do that, I typically will not do it just because I know what can happen and how that relationship can what they can turn into just because if something happens and you get the idea that you think I'm spending more money than I should have, or this shouldn't have cost that much, it's going to cause tension. So there's not many people that I would even consider doing it with at, at this point in time. But like I said, as the market changes, we've kind of had to change our contracts a little bit to cover ourselves on if, you know, there's a 10 or 15% increase in steel you know, when I gave you that budget versus when you approved the order, you know, we we lost some money, you know, when COVID hit due to some of those increases. And we just want it to be fair for our customer and ourself. So there there's a few language changes and we do have allowances on certain things, selections or appliances different that maybe you hadn't made a decision on before the contract was signed. So that line item itself is a cost plus, but not the overall okay. and the meat of the project. You're gonna get a sink, but if it's gold plated, it might cost a little more. That's right. If that's what you pick out, that's what you wanted, then that's right. All right, so you say, uh, I can't find you with Google. How can we find your company? No, you I mean, you can. We just don't pay to be number one on Google. But yeah, I mean, you, we, uh, we have a website, www.horizondevelopmentconstruction.com. Uh, or you probably just type in Horizon Development and it'll it'll pop up. How about uh, a phone number? Phone number seven one three five four five one eight nine seven. Um so yeah. This, this is for both residential well, and residential's Buster and Cogdell Builders dot com. So that uh, brand is Buster and Cogdell Builders. And my business partner Cooper Cogdell, same thing on the website and that was my mobile phone number, so you can call me on that for any anything. Uh, I've warned people against giving away their cell phones. But yeah, everyone has my cell phone number. Okay. Excellent. And your office is right near here. We're over on the, the west side of Houston. What is this called? The uh, Energy Corridor? Uh, I don't know quite where Energy Corridor. I, I don't know what this is exactly called. But we're basically at the Beltway and I-10 on the west side of Houston, just north of uh, the Beltway. And how far will you drive to build? It depends. Um our commercial work is all over Houston and surrounding areas, suburbs. Um, right now we have projects going on in Clear Lake, Pasadena, um, in town, Katy, um, Tomball. So we're so it's 70 miles. Typically about 70, but you know, if you told me, Hey, we're going to open up a building in San Antonio, I'd go build it. Okay. Um, but it would, that's just, it's per project, per customer. We start kind of getting out of town. It's an out of real out of town job. Um, but we have done work in Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, um, all over the place, but it just kind of depends on what the scope of work is. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on today. It's been a pleasure working you, with you all these years. You've done a great job. Everybody mm. likes their offices, so uh, keep up the good work. Yeah, well, I appreciate all the trust and business over the years, and it's been great and friendship, and I'm always here and look forward to many more years. Yeah, we'll try not to call you with any crises on Sundays. <laughs> hey, it's no worries. We'll, we'll take care of it. We'll see if we get you on the podcast again, but thanks for being on today. Thanks, Dan.